So good evening, students. Um, so we'll be um, going through like this. Uh, but initially, we'll start with a little history of uh, cervical cytology, and then we'll go and discuss the adequacy criteria. What are the techniques we use? The difference between uh, conventional and uh, liquid-based cytology. Then we'll be seeing some uh, pre-test images, which you can just uh, quickly uh, put down the answers to yourself. And after that, we'll go into the cases. Some of the pre-test uh, questions will be discussed as part of the case study, and whatever is not to discuss will be discussed at the end, at the end of the session. So, so let's start with the history of uh, cervical cytology. I think we have three students who are discussing the normal uh, cytology. So normal uh, overall attending. Sir. Okay. So uh, what do you mean by cervical cytology? What do we actually see? What part of the body do we examine? The uterine cervix, right? So, but when uh, the cervical cytology was initially developed or was in the stages of development by George Papanikulu, it was based on the vaginal smears. He used a pipette to collect samples from the vagina and he created smears with it and he examined them and compared it with the biopsies and he developed the vaginal cytology. But what we now see is from the uterine cervix. In 1943, Papanikulu and Trot is a gynecologist. They together published cancer of the uterus, the vaginal smear in its diagnosis. This was the first paper describing the utility of vaginal smears in uh, gynecological cancers. So, any idea who this lady is? Sweetie. Okay, so she is Gail uh, Papanicolo. Josh Papanicolo's wife. So, what is her contribution contribution to this? So, um, he uh, was born in Greece, and uh, he then moved to Germany for army training. Then he came back to Greece, served in the army. Then after that, he left and joined and reached the United States, where yeah, he joined a small lab and started researching. And he had an interest in he wanted to examine the cytological aspects of gynecological cancer, but the initial samples or the comparative samples where he examined the normal cells from the uh, original canal came from his wife. For almost 20 years, she helped him collect samples from herself and contributed so much to development of the cervical the, or the uh, pap smear, which we actually call it. Any idea who this person is? Sajana? Rajiv, what is this uh, stick like thing? It's the it's the very spatula. So, what is it called? Cervical spatula. Ice apple. Ice spatula. Right. So, this is Dr. James Ernstier. He is a gynecologist and a cytopathologist. He said instead of uh, sampling the uh, vaginal canal, we can as well directly sample the uterine cervix. And he developed this wooden stick, which is now used. Now we prefer to use plastic uh, spatulas. So after this uh, uterine cytology was developed, there was a paper published in 1954, and they said present evidence suggests that cervical cancer being present has already been there for several months. And therefore, a female population always contains many individuals with cervical cancer in various stages of development. If carcinoma in situ of cervix is the usual precursor of invasive carcinoma, then this will be the new stage of recognition of the disease in the population which is being screened. Which means, this cytological screening pro program was implemented, the diagnosis of uh, carcinoma cervix was at the stage of carcinoma in situ or the pre-invasive stage where you can prevent an invasive disease in the future. So based on this, um, Dr. Harald Zuzhausen, he identified the human papilloma virus. So what is the human role of human papilloma virus in cervical cancer? Sajana? 
ਸਾਜੇ ਨਾਲ uh e6 and e7 that's a pathogenesis so almost all of the cases are due to human papilloma virus so uh, dr hausen he received a nobel prize for it in 2008 and this was the first image of human papilloma virus which was published right so when coming to human papilloma virus we use these terms low risk hpv and high risk hpv based on how much it is associated with development of cervical carcinoma so uh, all uh, squamous lesions which are non cancerous or the low grade lesions or the low grade squamous lesions they are associated with low risk hpv like 6 7 16 and so on whereas those human papilloma viruses associated with cancer the 16 18 yes Okay, so these high-risk HPVs are associated with a high risk of development of cervical carcinomas. So the interpretation of uh, cervical cytology is based on the Bethesda system of reporting, and it has certain categories under it. So first, what we evaluate is the specimen adequacy. Then there are certain diagnostic categories. plastic findings which includes a list of things organisms epithelial cell abnormalities which can be squamous or glandular and several other malignant neoplasms so um this we have what type of question are sajana so conventional one only okay so uh, dr rajiv okay so the conventional smear is usually prepared when the sample is collected using an is patch and it is spread manually along a glass line fixed in situ and sent for staining So this is how a conventional smear looks with. This is stained smear. We are just looking it from above. So the streaks represent the cells which are being spread across the slide. Whereas the liquid-based cytology, which was introduced in 1996, was initially by this company, the Thinprem. It was followed by the other company, Shorta. We will see the differences later. This is how a liquid-based cytology slide looks. We have a circle of cells which are deposited onto a glass plate okay so between these two techniques the thin prep is based on suction so what happens the uh, sample after it is collected using a broom or a spatula is mixed with this fluid which is a methanol based preservative where the cells are put into suspension and this sample is sent to the lab where it is loaded into the thin prep machine where the um, cells are mixed thoroughly and what this methanol does is it lyses the rbcs and the mucus so when we uh, so dr sajana you have seen a conventional smear no so what do you think uh, obstructs your view of uh, cells in that um so background of uh, um back back uh, back back debris uh, and other uh, right so you get those inflammatory cells blood mucus all those obscuring the cells right so those things will be lysed in the uh, preservative itself so that the cells are better visualized and after it is mixed thoroughly a suction is applied through the stem and all the cells go and stick to the bottom of this cylinder so then this cylinder flips 180 degree and the slides are deposited and the cells are deposited onto a slide which is then stained and thin prep has a diameter of 20 mm whereas in sure path the broom which is used to collect the sample is detached from the stick and it is centrifuged 
and it is transferred into a sedimentation tube. It is based on density separation. So all the mucus and everything stays on above, whereas the denser cells settle to the bottom. So the cylinder is then placed on a slide and the cells are collected onto the slide. Short path has a diameter of 13 millimeters. So what is the advantage between this? We have already discussed, but is there any uh, clinical significance between uh, conventional and liquid based? So studies have shown that there is no difference in detection of squamous lesions uh, between a conventional smear and a liquid based cytology. But it makes examination more convenient because of lack of inflammation or any obscuring elements in the uh, smears. So uh, as we already discussed, this is how a conventional smear looks. You can see cells layered on top of each other in clumps and you know, sometimes the inflammation can be severe so as to obscure the visibility of the squamous cells. So that is one issue we face with uh, conventional smears and we are, we are forced to look at areas which are more well spread and well visible. So coming to adequacy of the smears, smears can be classified as satisfactory or unsatisfactory. It is called unsatisfactory when more than 75% of the squamous cells are obscured by any reason, any drying, hemorrhage or inflammation, anything other than that, it is satisfactory. <laughs> now, to examination of the satisfactory specimens, we should inform them in, uh, in the report about the presence of transformation zone. Why is that important, Dr. Rajiv? HPV shows epithelial towards the transformation zone. So, what is a transformation zone? It is the zone where the squamous epithelium is converting into the columnar epithelium from exocervix to endocervix. Okay, so why is it so vulnerable to HPV? Sir, because uh, sir, it can easily enter those cells, the HPV virus. So the summation zone is where the epithelium is the thinnest and the HPV can easily reach through micro wounds in the epithelium the which part of the epithelium? The basal cells. Right? So that is why the when we say that the transformation zone has been sampled, it, it serves as a quality indicator that there is a good chance of detecting uh, squamous or glandular lesions from that site. Okay, and any specimen which has any abnormal cells, squamous, glandular, whatever it is, is satisfactory and we do not call them unsatisfactory just for lack of adequate cellularity. So next comes to the topic of adequate cellularity. So in conventional smears, the adequacy criteria is 8000 to 12000 well preserved, well visualized squamous cells. So this is very important. Even if you have millions of cells if they are covered completely by inflammation of blood, then it would not be an adequate, adequate smear. For an LB, uh, liquid based preparation, it is 5000 squamous cells. And in patients who have received radiation, chemotherapy, hysterectomy, in those conditions, a, a cutoff of 2000 squamous cells is uh, recommended in both conventional and liquid based psychology. So, any doubts so far? Sajana, Rajiv, Sweetie, yeah, yeah. any other students? So again, uh, if you detect uh, any abnormality, irrespective of the cellularity, it is adequate. So if you find some abnormality, do not call that uh, smear as inadequate just because enough squamous cells are not there. Right? So now we will be going to see some pre-test spotter images. Uh, we will give around 10 seconds per slide. You can just uh, note your findings um, and they will be discussed as part of the slide session itself. So the first question is this. Next one. We'll go to the second spotter. Next one. Next 
next one please don't share the answers on the screen you can evaluate yourself when we discuss the answers so this is the cluster you need to look in this part of so next one So now the uh, cells you need to concentrate. the last one <coughs> so i think dr hemant before you can start the case a quick uh, clarification from the audience how do yes. we need to really count the cells for adequacy is the it's a question. yeah so um, bethesda does not recommend ca counting the cells but they have given certain formulas and Uh, reference images for conventional smears we have reference images in the bethesda atlas and it gives an indication of if you if the cellularity looks like this this will be the approximate cellularity so when you are examining a conventional smear you can use the bethesda atlas to compare it for an lpp we they have given certain formulas to calculate so you can take any random uh, field in the random representative field in the lbc smear and you can calculate it you need not count the individual cells thank you Is there any other questions, sir? One more is: Is there any really an advantage between sure path and thin path? Um, versus both of them? No, sir. There is no not much advantage in uh, between sure path and thin path in detecting uh, squamous or glandular lesions. So, Only thing is, I would uh, yeah, just one addition. Uh, Uh, the what they say, what the studies say that in thin prep, probably the yield of cells, squamous cells, may be little less because there's a filtration membrane, and if there is a lot of mucus in the slide, then uh, the membrane, the filtration membrane, may be obstructed, and the yield of squamous cells may be low. Otherwise, there is, as Dr. Heman uh, said, there is not much difference between the two. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. and one more important thing you need to know is between a conventional and a liquid based preparation cells are little smaller in liquid based cytology so the, the cells will look a little smaller and you need to set your uh, uh, criteria based on the preparation in which you are examining also the glandular clusters tend to be more compact in the lpp when when compared to a conventional smear so now i think we can get into the uh, cases uh, first case uh, Uh, Dr. Sweeney is there? Dr. Sweeney, are you there? I think we lost her. Can you extend for a second? Dr. Sajan, can you please read the question? Uh, case one: thirty years old female, routine screening, clean prep. <laughs> So most of the cases you will be seeing is will be part of routine screening only. With very few patients uh, coming for any specific symptoms. So what do you see here? Do you want to describe this? Um. 
Please say what do you think you think. What are these? Uh, uh, these max. What are these? These are uh, these uh, squ uh, superficial squamous cells. So they are basically squamous cells which we have seen in the screen, right? So these squamous cells are, you, uh, you can see here they have angulated uh, margins, abundant cytoplasm and small nuclei, right? So what we see here are the superficial cells. They are derived from the outermost layer of the cervical epithelium and they are seen in the proliferative phase of the cycle. The nucleus is highly condensed, so you can see very dark like nucleus, right? Now we see any chromatin characteristic in this. They are very tiny and condensed nuclei, which is 10 to 15 micron in micron square cross sectional area. And the cytoplasm usually is sulfurphilic. So now uh, this one, what do, you, uh, what do you think these cells are? These are intermediate cells. What do you think they are intermediate cells? Um, uh, holding up the nuclear, nuclear uh, cytoplasmic membrane, and uh, along with uh, the the size of the nucleus, yes. a bit larger, and um, um, and granular as well. Right. So when compared to the superficial cell, it's not a very hypnotic nucleus like this cell. <laughs> So like this cell which has a very pycnotic nucleus, this cell has a bigger looking nucleus and which has more cross-sectional area of about 35 micrometer square. Like these cells, these nuclei, this nuclei. And some of them may even show grooving like this one. Or like this one. Can you see the groove? So why is the um, this information required the area of the intermediate cell. It is um, uh, yes. So this the uh, reference site for other cells in this uh, cervical cytology. Yes. So when you are examining a smear, the first step would be to find the normal intermediate cell in the smear which you will use as a baseline for comparing any other abnormalities, right? Okay. So what are these? You see a lot of bacteria in the background, which are the lactobacilli. So what cell is this one? It's more likely to be a superficial cell. Superficial cell. Okay. So next case is Rajiv there. Yes, sir. Yeah, so can you go Yeah. So, um, okay, so what do you uh, see in this one? So, these are atrophic squamous cells. Why are you calling them atrophic squamous cells? So, then there is small, not pathology. Okay, so the and the crowding is more okay. Some superficial squamous cells are seen, and very few. So the image is not much enlarged. Yeah. In this image, what you can make out is the cells are more clustered or forming sheets. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, rather than single cells which we saw in the previous image, right? So that much we can make out in this image and a lot of inflammation in the background. And the cells are much smaller than the previous images. So these are primarily the parabasal cells which we see here. So these ones, these ones, this one. So they are more rounded, smaller than the superficial or intermediate cells, and they have a larger nucleus. And the cytoplasm is dense when compared to the intermediate cell. So how do we describe the cytoplasm of an intermediate cell? It's almost translucent, the superficial and intermediate cells. You can see uh, light nicely passing through the cytoplasm. Whereas in a parabasal cell, the cytoplasm is dense. 
the light doesn't easily pass through. That is why when these parabasal cells come in sheets like this, the light cannot easily pass through. That is why you have difficulty in interpreting these clusters. Okay. Yes. So you see these clusters. When do you see these clusters? Why do you see it in a postmenopausal uh, female? Uh, sir, uh, the hormonal because estrogen is uh, present in the patient uh, cells and after postmenopausal patients are uh, yes. So any uh, uh, any low estrogenic states like perimenopausal, postmenopausal, yes. pregnancy, or uh, post ovarectomy. So whenever the estrogen levels are low, you start seeing more of parabasal cells because the normal squamous maturation is dependent upon estrogen. Right. Yeah. So in any uh, any situation where the estrogen level is low, you start seeing more of these parabasal cells, and atrophy is a pattern of uh, this one. Uh, and uh, one more uh, type of squamous cells which we need to see are the metaplastic squamous cells and you can differentiate them from parabasal cells in that they are more angulated. Can you see the uh, cells? The previous parabasal cells. Yeah, so uh, they are, what, what, can you please repeat? I think uh, some some of the audience can't see the pointers, Dr. Gitman. Could you use a... Uh... Okay. So these cells. So um, compared to the previous yes, image, you can see here these have a rounded contour, right? Whereas this one is more angulated, that's very dense looking cytoplasm and larger nucleus. So very similar to that of a metaplastic squamous cells. So, uh, before going to uh, further uh, pathological conditions, uh, a short uh, summary on the role of HPV. So, as we already discussed, HPV goes and infects the basal layer of the squamous epithelium. On the left hand side here, you can see the normal maturation, right? So, the basal cells mature upwards as they go and they become mature superficial squamous cells. Similarly, when the basal cells are infected, the when the uh, by a low risk uh, human papilloma virus, the uh, DNA of the virus stays outside the nucleus of the cell and it proliferates as the cell matures, does not integrate with the nucleus of the host cell. So, there is normal maturation in a low grade lesion, whereas when there is infection by a high risk HPV, it integrates with the basal cell DNA and it prevents the normal maturation of cells and leads to uncontrolled proliferation and cancer. Like uh, previously discussed, the E6 and E7 proteins are the major pathogenic proteins in HPV. Okay. So whatever cytological features we are going to uh, look for in an abnormal squamous cell are the result of HPV infection in squamous cells. So uh, now we can move to the squamous lesions. Um, and one query from the chat box, why do the cells stain differently? Some are orange and some are green and some are pink. Uh, so, um, the pap stain, it has a lot of different uh, stains in it, the orangey, the, then there's uh, I don't remember the, other, the green stain. Light green, that is light, light green, green. Light, light green. green yeah, so this is based on the pH of the cells, the superficial cells are almost Metabolically inactive. There is the orangey, uh, the orangey uh, stain small superficial cells which are uh, metabolically inactive. There is uh, light green SF stains more the metabolic, uh, metabolically active so, uh, intermediate cells. That is why we have some staining quality difference. Also, the orange color of the superficial cells is because of uh, keratin present in the cytoplasm of these cells. Yes. Whereas the, uh, uh, the intermediate cells, they have a cyanophilic cytoplasm, that is bluish green colored cytoplasm. And as you rightly said, uh, under, the, uh, uh, under the influence of progesterone, so they are found in the progesteronic phase of the cycle and they, they contain glycogen also in their cytoplasm. 
and especially in pregnancy we have something called boat shaped cells or navicular cells these intermediate cells their uh, margins become folded and they become boat shaped to accommodate all the glycogen in their cytoplasm so we call those cells the navicular cells So, uh, can I continue, sir? Are there any more questions? No, I think it's enough. Okay. So, famous patients, uh, we have, we can have Dr. Shelly, Dr. Ganot, and Dr. Akansha. And Dr. Shelly, are you? Thirty-two-year female, routine screening, thin prep, LPC. Okay. So, uh, let's start with this image. What is this cell? Sir, this is uh, intermediate. Good. So this one? This is superficial. Right. So don't look at the cytoplasmic color. Look at the nucleus. Yes. Okay, so that is what we observe on this slide. Now do you want to describe this cluster? Okay, now I'll point out the cells who go one by one. Okay. So this cell. So this is uh, intermediate squamous epithelial cell. Okay. But uh, it is having high NC ratio. Okay. And uh, the uh, chromatin is fine chromatin, and the nuclear membrane is a bit irregular. Okay. And, uh, there is also a nucleoli in the center and lacy cytoplasm. Okay. So uh, one thing, the those are not nucleoli. That's just clumped chromatin in the cells and what about this cell this is a binucleated cell okay. okay then anything else can you make out anything like that it is having this what is this thing Yes. Maybe you can click on the right. Go back to the picture. Yes. I click and remove that. Yes. Remove all the erase. Erase all. Yes. This shouldn't have happened. I do not know what's the reason for this. Yeah, we can't see the images. I should come back now. Yeah. So, can you make out a line around this nucleus? Yes, sir. And this one, what is that? Hello, perinuclear. I is more of perinuclear vacuum, right? So, what happens? Uh, we will discuss this later. So we will go to the next slide. So. Uh, These cells. These cells are uh, less mature than the previous slide and they are having high NC ratio. Okay, so those are only seeing part of the cell, so we'll ignore that. So what about this? Uh, just imagine this is this cell, okay? So this is the cell here. So what you are seeing is because these clusters are three dimensions. So there is some overlapping of the cells. You may not see the entire cytoplasm of these cells. Okay. So here you can see this is the actual cell and this is the nucleus. Okay. And what is this one? Intermediate cell. So that is your comparison, right? So how, uh, what do you think? of this nucleus compared to this cell? Sir, the nucleus is around uh, more than two times uh, of the nucleus of intermediate. Right. So you compare the size of the nucleus with the size of an intermediate cell, right? Nucleus. And you can see this kind of notching in this nucleus, some nuclear membrane irregularity here. And again, you can see this notch in the membrane, right? Uh, again here, uh, this cell, the nucleus is enlarged. Similarly here, 
this cell compared to this cell there is nuclear enlargement and or, so there is binucleation or probably an indentation I'm not sure so this is from the textbook very classical picture so what is this is what i was mentioning in the initial picture what is this the perinuclear vacuolation and what is it called ियोसाइटोसिस So this is low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. So there are few uh, features of an LSIL. The cells occur singly or in clusters. And they usually confined to mature skinny or superficial open squamous cells. Why is that? Why don't you see that in current uh, cells? Sir, it is affecting the upper layer. If we go in HCL, then all the layers progressively are affected. But here we see the changes only in the upper mature layers. That is because it's mostly associated with the low risk HCL, right? Wherein the cell maturation is still there. Squamous cells are maturing, and the virus travels with the squamous cell. So we see more intermediate type squamous cells. And the very important criteria: the nuclear enlargement size. Should be more than three times the area of a normal intermediate nucleus in that slide. Okay, so so the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is little increased, but it's not very high NC ratio like you see in a high grade lesion where the nucleus occupies seventy to eighty percent of the cell because both the cytoplasm and the nucleus enlarge in size. Okay, compared to a normal cell, they are increased, but the ratio is not that much increased. And this nuclei can be of variable shape. The chromatin can be granular or smudgy. Nuclear contours can be variable, can be smooth, can be very irregular, like notches, in which we see, uh, like we saw in our images. And you can see binucleation or multinucleation. Okay. And this coil importance of coilocytosis is that it is not required for interpretation of LSI. Cell. What is more important are the nuclear changes. Right. So what are the nuclear changes? Let me note. Nuclear enlargement more than three times. Yes, and the nuclear indentation, the chromatin changes all those. So just because you have coilocytosis, that does not make it LSI. Okay. That is what you need to remember. So as mentioned, like this cell, the uh, potential you want, you want to describe this cell. What do you think about this cell? So this this cytoplasmic uh, nucleus and its pseudo coilocytosis is irregular. So um, you can see uh, that the nuclear membrane is regular, the chromatin is regular. So this is called the pseudo coilocytosis. It should not be interpreted as. We should always look for the corresponding nuclear species. There are certain mimics of L cell which common to be an herpes infection variant situation. So uh, patients who receive radiotherapy for uh, cancer, cervical cancer, when you take the radiotherapy, you see this markedly enlarged squamous cell. You get these large nuclei, but uh, what do you think about the NC ratio? So let's take this. The cell. NC ratio will be low in case of radiation, yes. and it, uh, it characteristically shows two to, uh, cytoplasm, and there's vacuolation also, okay. and there will be no uh, uh, no perinuclear clearing. Okay, so perinuclear clearing may or may not be present, but the nuclear the chromatin will be more smudged, and the You will see the nuclear features of the cell. So that is more important. Okay. 
questions any doubts over there's a couple of doubts in the chat box why is the coelocytic change seen in the intermediate cells yeah so like i mentioned they infect the basal cells the hpv virus but by the time the cytological manifestations manifest this switch cell is already started maturing so there is normal maturation going on along with the hpv proliferation so by the time there's a, all the cytological or the nuclear features develop this cell has reached its maturation that's why you don't see the changes in the base flora paraphyses think dr namrata that answers both your questions so you can add it डॉक्टर विनोद कमिंग बैक टू द सेम इमेज विच वी ऑलरेडी डिस्कस Okay, we'll yeah. so we are coming back to the same image which we saw Dr. Shelly. Yeah. So what was this cell? What are what are these findings on the virus of these cells? Cells, uh, there is, uh, these are intermediate cells, but there is nuclear enlargement. Yeah, so compared to this cell, it's a normal intermediate cell. How many times do you think it has enlarged? It is about two and a half. I would say more than that, right? Three to four, three, three and a half times. More than three to four. Yeah. So this would be this would qualify as. What would be the diagnosis? More than three times enlargement with some nuclear membrane irregularity. Atypical is for the cell. Nice. Atypical is for the cell. Why? So because uh, the uh, in cell there will be nuclear enlargement less than three times of the uh, normal intermediate cell. More than three times, no? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, in actual, there will be less than uh, three times, but in ascus, there will be more than three times. And oh, you are confusing yourself. Just because you saw the slide. But in ascus, it is two point five to three times, and in elsel, it is it is more than three times. Right. So more than three times is elsel. So just make this concept very clear. More than three times enlargement is elsel. Okay. So anything less than that would be yeah. this what we are going to discuss like this this okay, these cells are in that nuclear enlargement type of nuclear enlargement right? you are you are agree with it part of the cell or even you can take this one also so there is nuclear enlargement but it is not enough to qualify for a low grade squamous lesion right so that is when we in this category of atypical squamous cells of significance okay so what would be this so this There are some uh, criteria or uh, uh, scenarios where we get a diagnosis. So, usually, it's approximately two and a half to three times more than three times that of the background squamous cell. So, three types of a uh, metaplastic cell nucleus. Only twice in the metaplastic squamous cell. Because the nucleus is already larger, right? It's slightly increased NC ratio. There is some hyperchromasia and irregularity, but it is not convincing for an L cell. Sometimes you can get orangeophilic, orangeophilic keratin cytoplasm, but the nucleus does not show all the features of uh, L cell. 
or the vacuum. So that is more also important. When you see the coilocytic vacuum, it should be complete and fully developed for to call it as an LCM. Whereas if it is fully developed, you only see part of a vacuum or some incomplete cytoplasmic gearing. Those are situations where you would call it as an as plus. Okay. So here you can see there is uh, can you see the mouse pointer? Is the mouse pointer visible? Yes. So can you use this as to point the cell? These images are disappearing to use of, uh, the pointer. So I can point the cells if anybody wants to just mention I'll point the cells again. Uh, what about this cluster? You can see there is some nuclear enlargement. And there is some nuclear membrane irregularity, but not enough to call it a Similarly, here also, maybe this one cell is there with some kind of a vacuum, some nuclear enlargement, not enough to qualify for an ASCUS. What about this one, Dr. Uh, Akansha? What do you think about this image? What do you think of these famous cells? They are enlarged, the nucleus is enlarged. To about uh, uh, two and a half to three. Okay. And then uh, the entry ratio is not. Okay, it's not very high. It's not. That's a normal hyperchromatia. Okay. Are you seeing any nuclear membrane irregularity? No, so no nuclear chromatinous fine granular and dispersed human okay. so there is just nuclear enlargement if you take this as this as the normal squamous cell there is some nuclear enlargement other than that nothing else is there right so these are the perimenopausal cells or the pm cells so you need to always look at the age of a patient when you are evaluating a smear so you can have the criteria for squamous patients okay so, uh, one more uh, important factor about ASCUS is unlike L cell, where you see a cell with a large nucleus of uh, three times, four times the size of a background cell, that cell becomes an L cell. Whereas ASCUS diagnosis is for a smear, it's not for a particular cell. So, in a smear, when there are not enough cells to qualify as an L cell, the overall smear becomes the ASCUS diagnosis. There may be a spectrum of nuclear enlargement, nuclear membrane irregularities. But none of these changes will reach the criteria for an L cell. Understand? So th that is, uh, Dr. Hemant, what he said is absolutely correct. Ascus and L cell both are uh, both affect the intermediate cells. But when the L cell criteria is not met, that is qualitatively or quantitatively, the cells fall short of L cell. We put them in the category of Ascus. And then as he described about coilocytes, now in coilocytes, uh, he said there is a, a perinuclear cavitation. So a perinuclear cavitation, yes, it usually occupies more than two thirds of the cytoplasm and the cell outlines in a coilocyte are markedly thickened. They are because of uh, peripheral condensation of the cytoplasm, the cell margins are markedly thickened. The cavitation, the perinuclear cavitation or the perinuclear halo, we don't use the term halo usually for that. So it's a cavitation and it should occupy more than two thirds of cytoplasm. And of course, mandatory that the accompanying nuclear changes should be there. And nuclear changes can be nuclear enlargement with chromatin abnormality, or you can even have a resinoid hyperchromatic shrunken nucleus. So two types of pinacolocyte, either nuclear enlargement or you can have a shrunken hyperchromatic resinoid nucleus also. So that also qualifies as a coilocyte. So anything short of this will go in the category. If it doesn't completely fulfill the criteria of coilocyte or other changes, then it goes in the category of ASCUS. So both are the lesions of intermediate squamous cells. Thank you. Please continue, Dr. Yes, thank you. So now going to the next phase, uh, Can you please read the history? For, for, for a year, female with the uh, discharge for Yeah. So, what do you see in this? This cell, what do you think it is? Right. So, what about these cells? What do you think the differences between these? 
this cell and this. I think you can move to a better image, this one. Can you describe this cluster? Glandular. Why do you think it's glandular? You see something in between these cells here? Some junction like things in between. So these are parabasal type cells, right? Smaller cells than compared to this larger intermediate cell. But what about the nucleus? So let's take this as a normal cell, parabasal cell, and compared to this, what do you think is happening here? Nucleus is smaller, larger. Nucleus is larger. Yeah, so okay, what do you think about the LC ratio? High LC ratio. Yes, LC ratio is very high. Compared to this cell, it's less than 50%. Almost 70 80% yes. of the cell is occupied by this large nucleus. And yes, so what about the nucleus shape? Yes. Like this cell? There is some indentation, right? Yes. What about the chromatin? Dense and more darker, coarse. Yeah, you can see this coarser granules. Look, chromatin. Yes. Okay. So, this one. Sorry. I think there's something in the. Yeah, maybe you, you can share again. Maybe you can do one thing. Yes, sir. Sharing and share again the slides. Okay, sir. This one. This is again. Yeah. Yeah. I think we lost Sweetie. Sweetie somewhere in the audience. But he is muted. Doctor Sweetie. <coughs> Is this possible now? Yeah. Again, it's. I think there is something in your settings in your own laptop. When you copy paste, you know, from somewhere else, sometimes it happens when you copy from the old document. Maybe for these slides, you can just, without the screen, you can just use. You can do the small screen, yeah, yeah, like this. Okay, okay. So, like this one? That we know this cluster. The paravasal cells cluster, sir. This okay. is the uh, high NC ratio. Yeah. The core form of ten. Yes. And irregular nuclear membranes, right? Irregular nuclear. Okay. So about this one, this we concentrate on this cluster. Yes. Sir. Similar findings, right? Similar so, here, Yeah. Yeah. So, but. Um, so, what do you think about this cell, this orange or filling cell? There is some vacuole around it. Will it qualify for a, uh, What will it qualify for? There is some cytoplasmic orangophilia, some partial perinuclear adaptation. Yeah, so what do you think it will qualify for? Will it be else? What about this cell? Large nucleus here. Maybe this would qualify, large nucleus like this one. It's missing part of cytoplasm. But here this cell you can see, an intermediate type cell with a very large nucleus. So this might qualify for an L cell, whereas this could qualify more for a mascus. Right? Okay, so now this coming back to these clusters, this would be high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. So the cells of H cell are smaller, show less cytoplasmic maturity than L cell. Why is that? 
So what happens here is the virus integrates, the high risk HPV DNA integrates with the host DNA and it prevents maturation of the squamous cells. Okay, so it, the cells no longer mature into intermediate type and superficial type cells. They just keep on proliferating and they start looking similar to parabasal type cells only. So that is the difference between X and X. Okay, the cytoplasmic maturity. So they, these cells can occur singly, sheets or in syncytial aggregates when it is called as the hyperchromatic crowded groups which has its own differential diagnosis will be discussed later. And this sometimes they can look very small also especially in liquid based preparations the cell cells are very small. So you should always concentrate on any single small cell which is in the And they are usually found in between the bigger clumps of cells. So you have to go very meticulously to identify a head cell. Nuclear contour is irregular, demonstrates prominent integrations of grooves. The cytoplasm is variable, it can be characterized as an orangeophilic or uh, um, very lazy and delicate appearing also. So um, that's the attention. Imagine you are examining a smear, okay, and uh, you find this type of cell. What do you think about this cell? This one. This is high in series group. Yeah. It is a nuclear membrane, post yeah. Okay. So uh, now I tell you, this is the only uh, cell which looks like this in the entire smear. Rest are all looking like that. What do you, what do you, what do you call it? As? Or the like this? Yes. Yeah, like this cell. Like, uh, yeah. Or like this, just this single cluster. So then the category of atypical uh, squamous cells cannot exclude an cell comes into play. So that is in the cells, this uh, situation occurs when these abnormal cells are very sparse and they occur singly in small groups of less than 10 cells. Um, when you have curation, it goes to a cell, but it's more of a quantitative. Like, you see very few squamous cells which are looking suspicious for a head cell, but it is not uh, uh, qualifying for a head cell. Right? But uh, Bethesda, towards the last of ASCH, says when you see a cluster of cells, when the nucleus is showing marked nuclear abnormality with high NC ratio, coarse chromatin, and even if it is few, it favors more of a head cell than a ASCH diagnosis. So it's a little subjective also, but uh, it's there. So when you see very few cells, the nuclear environment is that you are not convinced that it is reaching the criteria for a head cell. So then you would use this criteria of atypical squamous cells, you cannot to exclude a head cell. Okay. Um, so, uh, is Shelly there? Yes, sir. Yeah, you want to describe this one? This sir, is a um, 50 years female with uh, bleeding per vagina. Sir, in this cluster, we can see uh, hyperkeratin. The, the keratin is increased in the cells because it is orangeophilic, but, but the nucleus is intact. So, it could be parakeratosis. Okay. Do you think you will get so much clumping and hyperchromasia in parakeratosis? Okay, we will put another picture. What about this one? Sir, in the center I can see a tadpole cells. Sir, all the cells they are having, uh, first of all there are superficial squamous cells and intermediate squamous cells. Okay. And they are scattered, okay. they are not in clusters. Okay. And uh, okay. All of the cells are having uh, nuclear pleomorphism with irregular nuclear membrane and uh, nucleoli is also present. Yes. In the center, there are two tadpole cells. Right. These ones, right? Yes, sir. Are they also called as what? Caudate cells. Okay. And you can see some spindle cells like this, very yeah. abnormal nuclei, hyperchromasia. Anything in the background you wish to comment on? Tumor diathesis. What is tumor diathesis? Sir, because uh, necro it, it is a necrotic debris. Yeah, like this. You can see this one. 
you can see this granular material in the background clinging to the cells, right? So this is tumor diathesis. Again, coming here, what is this structure? The pearl. Yeah, so it's a squamous pearl. But here you can see a very abnormal looking squamous cells, right? Here, if you put everything together, very abnormal looking squamous cells, very keratinized appearance, squamous pearls, tumor diathesis. Keratinizing squamous. Cell carcinoma, right? So you put everything together, it becomes a squamous cell carcinoma. And here again, you can see this debris clinging to the cells. And why uh, this is important is in LPP, most of the diathesis is removed by the preparation step itself. So you get very little diathesis in uh, LPPs and it becomes difficult to recognize invasive features. So you need to look very closely to the cells and see this debris clinging to the cells. Okay. Whereas if this is from a conventional smear, you can see a lot of debris in the background. And what do you think about this one, like this cluster? Uh, here we can see a cluster uh, and uh, sir, they are uh, overlapping, uh, some overlapping and uh, there is nuclear pleomorphism yes. and the nuclear membrane is irregular, there is high MC ratio. Yeah. There is presence of nucleolite. Yeah. In the background? In the background, there is inflammatory cells. Background. Necrotic debris also. Necrotic so this is how a non keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma would look. Okay, so the cells are much smaller and difficult to call squamous directly, right? Because it is more of the non keratinizing type. So in squamous cell carcinoma, cells predominantly can occur as single cells or in cellular aggregates. Caudate and spindle cells can be seen and the keratinizing type contains dense orangeophilic cytoplasm. Marked nuclear variation will be there. You can see macronucleoli more in the non-keratinizing type. And a very important feature to look for is the tumor diathesis. Okay. So I think we reach the end of squamous lesions. Are there any questions? One related uh, query was when the smear is predominantly composed of orangeophilic superficial cells and very much less intermediate cells, does this indicate anything in particular? No, it is in any normal mature squamous epithelium, you can get a predominance of uh, superficial type squamous cells. It doesn't have much significance. It's more the proliferative phase value where there's a lot of estrogen levels. It has no significance. Sharjit ma'am, any comments from you in, at this juncture? Uh, actually, we, uh, yeah, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, if there are a lo lot of these uh, nucleated, uh, I mean, a lot of these superficial squamous cells compressed together with an orangeophilic cytoplasm, uh, that's also called parakeratosis. Of course, as he said, uh, uh, as long as it's not an atypical parakeratosis showing nuclear enlargement or other features, normal parakeratosis can be seen in inflammatory conditions or in uh, other uh, um, uh, benign uh, condition. So that could be uh, parakeratosis also. If we see these clumps of uh, orangeophilic cells, superficial cells. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, so, yeah. so now Dr. Jennifer will be continuing with the glandular lesions. I'll hand over to ma'am. Uh, can you see this uh, PPT? Yes. Yeah, yes, some minutes. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope all of you have had a good exposure now to the squamous part of the cervical cytology. Actually speaking, sir, the squamous part is much, much more important for you to understand and recognize, especially the normal morphology, and then to go on to uh, see the abnormal morphology in squamous epithelial cells. So glandular cells are actually a little more difficult to begin with. And um, quite often glandular cells, it's really not uh, easy to see the chromatin pattern. It's not very uh, often that we see distinct cells very clearly. So. Um, 
it's more about you know getting your eyes trained to recognizing the architecture of these cells and the presence of these cells as crowded groups within the entire spectrum of the cells that you would see in any cervical smear. So, um, most importantly, Medestar says that cervical cytology is a screening test primarily for the detection of squamous cell carcinoma of cervix and its precursors. So, it's not primarily a test for glandular cells. It's not a screening test for glandular abnormalities. It's a screening test for squamous abnormalities. So, transformation zone, as Dr. Hemant very clearly explained, is not always necessary for an adequate specimen, but it's always reported because the presence of the in, uh, transformation zone tells us that the examination is complete. So, what does this complete transformation zone comprise? At least 10 well-preserved endocervical or squamous metaplastic cells, which are present singly or in clusters. So what happens if there is insufficient endocervical or transition zone component in any smear? So if the patient is 30 years or older, we don't do this as a routine test in our country, though some of the centers have definitely started as HR, that is high-risk HPV testing is preferred. So if HR HPV testing is not available or has not been performed, within three years, a repeat cytology is acceptable. If transformation zone has not been sampled. If the patient is less than 30 years, even if the transformation zone has not been sampled, uh, repeat uh, is not required ahead of time, routine screening is sufficient and that is what is recommended by the American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. So we'll start with case one. Case one, uh, we will be actually starting again with normal morphology and then we will go on to the glandular cell abnormalities. So, uh, once again, can I have uh, Sweetie or Sajana or Raji? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes. So, uh, Sweetie, shall we start with you? So, this is a 35 year old lady. Routine, most of them come as routine as Dr. Hemant said. But please note, LMP was seven days ago and she also has an intrauterine contraceptive device for the past three years. All right. So now we are going to start with what you're seeing in low power. So you can see all these cells in the background, which are all these famous epithelial cells. What do you think these cells are? Do they look different from these other clusters? Yes, These are the... Honeycomb shaped clusters of cells. These are endocervical cells. Yes, very good. So, this is the slightly higher power of the same cluster. So, like you rightly pointed out, this is the honeycomb pattern. So, here you can see this pattern very clearly. So, what do, what do you mean by honeycomb pattern, sweetie? Oh, uh, Ma'am, yeah. all are arranged in a honeycomb pattern at the clustering of cells. Okay, so um, what is very clearly visible here is that it is monolayered, isn't it? There is really no overlap. Flat sheet. It is a flat sheet. Very good. And what are you seeing between the cells? What is that? Very distinctly, you're able to make vacuolate. What are those lines? What are those lines? I think you said it. Cytoplasmic. Cytoplasmic membranes. So the cytoplasmic membranes are very clear, very well discerned. So you can see that it is a flat sheet. And do you think they look very dark, these nuclei, or are they light colored? They are light colored. Light colored, isn't it? So this is hypochromatic. The nuclei are relatively hypochromatic. And they are a flat sheet, monolayered, and you can see the cytoplasmic membrane very well discerned. So again, this part is showing you the honeycomb pattern. What is this part looking like? What pattern would you call this? Ticket fence appearance. Ticket fence appearance, very good. Side so view. It? Side view. Yes, side view. Okay, so what is this material here on top? Why is the nucleus pushed to the bottom? What 
kind of cells are endocervical cells to begin with? Columnar cells. Columnar cells, very good. So columnar cells have got, what is this thing? What's here? Cilium. Dominical plate. Tuft of cilia from this, tuft of cilia from dominant plate. Leucin. Talking about uh, intracytoplasmic. Leucin. Mucin, yes, very good. So that is the mucin which is present. There. So here again, you can see that picket fence appearance and the nucleus is pushed to the bottom because this part of the cell is occupied by mucin. So here the polarity is maintained with nucleus at the bottom and mucin at the top of the cell. So, so this is the picket fence appearance of these endocervical cells. Now again, another sheet to show you. So here you can see the chromatin what do you think the chromatin looks like and what are those tiny, you know, little darker things? Granular, finely, granular chromatin. Finely granular chromatin. What do you think about the nuclear membrane? Is there any irregularity? It is smooth nuclear contours, but there is some variation, there is mild variation and sometimes even marked variation in the size of the cells. Sorry? Vesicular nucleus. with fine chromatin, but there is variation in the size of the nuclei. But again, there is no overlapping. That is very important to note. There is no overlapping here and the cell membranes are quite distinct. Okay? Alright, so columnar epithelium with variable nuclear sizes, slightly larger. Like Dr. Hemans pointed out, always the intermediate squamous cell nucleus serves as your baseline to compare the other cells with. So this is slightly larger than that of the intermediate cell. And the chromatin is finely granular, evenly distributed in the small nucleus. You could see those tiny point things there. So those are the small nucleus which are seen in normal endocervical cells. And the cytoplasm can be diffusely vacuolated. Yeah, you can see that it almost looks empty, the cytoplasm. So that is because it's vacuolated or it can be granular. And we saw how polarity is maintained, nucleus at one end and mucus at the other end. And you all very beautifully explained the picket fence and the honeycomb. And you need to remember that when it is from the upper part of the endocervical canal, the cells can very closely mimic squamous metaplastic cells. Quite often, we are unable to differentiate between the two. So sometimes these cells can even appear like this, you know, very um, what we call as hypochromatic crowded groups. So it can look like a very thick hypochromatic fragment where you really cannot make out the hypochromasia or the finely granular chromatin, but you can see that there is this pattern here. So sometimes the, this does get mistaken for glandular abnormality and as much as possible towards the periphery of the groups you have to look at the chromatin and then you will be able to that this is only a normal endocervical group. But this can throw us into a diagnostic dilemma sometimes. Now look at this sheet. So you can see, tell me about that cell. Are you able to see my pointer? Yeah. So probably the nucleus size compared this and this. Is there this is enlarged with different nucleus. Yeah, there is a nucleus out there. Raji, what do you think about the chromatin, Raji? Okay. Yeah. So there is enlargement, but you can see the nucleoli there, but the chromatin is still very fine. Again, here also, you can see that there is actually marked increase in nucleus size compared with this. 
within the same sheet, you see marked announcer nucleuses within the same cluster. But again, please note that there is not much overlap. Some minimal overlap is happening here, but the chromatin remains fine and hypochromatic. hypochromatic. What are all these other cells that you're seeing here? These are intermediate. I'm talking about these ones. Talking about these. This is a. Yeah, they are, that's a sheet of endocervical cells. But what are these? Polymers. They are the polymers. So you can see that there are polymers within this. You can see that this sheet is showing marked anisonucleosis. And in the previous one, we saw that there was also some prominence of nucleoli. So this will fall under. So this is reactive or repair. Okay, so this is the reactive or repair in endocervical cells. Textbook gives us very clear picture of this is supposed to be the interdigitating school of fish appearance or it is a mechanical pull apparently while processing. So the cytoplasmic appendages get pulled and so that is called as a taffy pull appearance. So this is supposed to be the architecture of a reactive cervical group. We may not always see this architecture, but you can see again there are a lot of neutrophils in the background and also intracytoplasmic. And you can see that there are nucleoli which are very clearly visible within these clusters. So this is how you recognize endocervical cells which are shown reactive or repair features. So they are cohesive sheets and interdigitating fish architecture with a taffy pull appearance. The septoplasmic boundaries are well defined. That's what we saw. I'm sorry, I can't see the pictures now. Yeah, so we saw that the cytoplasmic, there is not much overlap. So each cell is distinct from the next one. So that is a very important feature. But the cytoplasm itself can show polychromasia, vacuolization, or perinuclear halos. And there is variable nuclear enlargement. They can be marked anisonucleosis within the same cluster. Typically, they are not overlapping. Outlines you all described very nicely that they are smoothly contoured. There is no irregularity of nuclear membrane. Again, we all talked about the vesicular chromatin and hypochromatin and uniformly finely granular chromatin saw the presence of nucleoli. So this is how reactive endocervical cells will look. Now, um, Sajina, I told you that she has had her LMP seven days ago. Isn't it? That was part of the so What do you think these clusters are? Um, ma'am, these are the exodus ball. Um, that is the endometrial cells. Yes, very good. So these are the endometrial clusters. So what is most catching in this field? Here you can see all these squamous, but this endocervical is just standing out as a very dark looking cluster. So when you're looking at it under low power, that is what catches your attention. So there are these very tightly cohesive, dark looking cells, small clusters lying in the back. So that is what you need to pick up as endometrial cells. So is this normal um, surgery? Yes, ma'am. Uh, basically, it is uh, seen during six uh, to ten days of the menstrual uh, menstrual cycle. After six to ten days of the menstrual cycle, so it is a normal finding. Okay. So when will you get worried? In what age group will you get worried? If if, uh, 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 if uh, after forty five years, if this type of cells are seen, that would be abnormal. Yes. So you need to report it when you're seeing it in anybody who is more than forty five years. Because up to that, it's reproductive age group and it's a, this is considered to be a normal finding. So in postmenopausal women, it is abnormal. So you need to report it in more than 45 years or older. Again, Bethesda reminds us that survival psychology is not in, in, intended to screen for endometrial patients and should not be actually used as a test of evaluation for suspected endometrial abnormalities. But we do see this often. When we see it, we need to report it. Okay? So again, you can again see that these are 
very dark clusters. So what kind of contour is this? Outer one is the glandular one and the inner one is the stromal cells. Okay, so inside this exodus ball, this is the stromal cells and you see a layer of glandular epithelium. This just looks very dark. You really cannot make out any glandular component or stromal component. Sometimes endometrial cells, this is all you can see in real life. When you're looking at it under the microscope, this is probably how much you can make out. What are these cells, Rajiv? These are also uh, endometrials, just clusters. Are these endometrial cells? Thank you. Don't they look oh, yes, a bit? They are tall columnar cells, aren't they? You can't really make them very well, but there seems to be some reason here. And the nuclear at the bottom. Yeah, so do you see mucin and endometrial cells? Which glandular cells will show mucin? Endocervical cells. Actually, a picket fence cluster of endocervical cells. So again, like uh, Sarjana described, so this is the exodus ball. So now these cells, if you have to look at the morphology and describe them, they're typically smaller than endocervical cells. You can see that. They are much smaller. These cells are really small compared to the endocervical cells that we saw earlier. Normally, it's a, they have high NC ratio. So, most of the cell is actually occupied by the nucleus. And the chromatin, you really can't make out much because it is dense and a heterogeneous chromatin normally. Nuclearly, usually not seen but may be seen in LVC preparations. Mitosis are usually absent. Cytoplasm is scant, making the NC ratio high. And cell borders are not as well discerned as we saw in the honeycomb pattern of endocervical cells. You really can't make out cell borders clearly in endometrial cells. Now, when it is such a tight cluster, very often we might think that it looks abnormal because it looks really dark. And we start wondering if it is an epithelial abnormality. But small and the monotonous nuclear size should prevent us from over-interpreting it as squamous or as glandular abnormality. These are some textbook pictures again to show you more of these tight massive clusters of endometrial cells. Here this is showing that they can be even apoptosis within the endometrial cells because we have seen it all the time in, in the biopsies, isn't it? So endometrial cells can show apoptosis. So these are some of the textbook pictures again to show you the same. This is the exodus ball. Again, textbook picture this is. This is stromal cells within, stromal cells within, and there is a glandular layer around it. Okay, so this is the typical appearance of exodus ball. Now, uh, sweetie, what cells are these? She is in reproductive age, right? She is also showing such cells. What cells are these? What is this arrow pointing to here? What are these things here? Anyone? Cilia, terminal places. Uh, so these are actually cilia. Are they normally seen in endocervical cells, cilia? No. no. So what do you think this is? Tubal metaplasia. So this is tubal metaplasia. So when you look at this cluster, Actually, it can look a little bit scary, isn't it? Because it looks crowded. Normally, endocervical cells don't show that. So there is crowding, there is overlapping. The chromatin actually looks a bit coarse and it's dark, right? But you need to look for these cilia. So when you see these cilia, you need to realize that these are actually the normal cells which are just showing tubal metaplasia. What do you mean by tubal metaplasia? What tube are we talking about? Fallopian tube. Very good. So, it is metaplastic epithelium that recapitulates that of the normal fallopian tube. So, you can see ciliated cells, you can see peg cells, you can even see goblet cells. This is actually a textbook picture and that is supposed to be a goblet cell there. So, you can see any of these types of cells. 
and this is one of the most common benign processes in the glandular component to be misinterpreted as endocervical atypia or as neoplasia. Like we saw in the previous one, this enlarged nuclei, crowded nuclei, nuclear stratification, etc., can be seen, but the terminal bars and cilia will establish the benign interpretation. So that was tubal metaplasia. Now, Rajiv. I also mentioned that this patient has, has been on IUCD. She has been wearing a IUCD, intrauterine contraceptive device, for the past three years. I just want to remind you all of that history. And in that context, can you tell me what you're seeing here? What cells are these? Glandular cells or squamous cells? They are glandular cells. Yes, they are glandular cells. Okay. Yeah, there is so much of this vacillation. You see, and then the nucleus is where? Yes, you're seeing prominence of nucleoli good. And the nucleus is actually pushed to the periphery, isn't it? So there's a big vacuum here. Nucleus is pushed to the periphery. Nucleus has got nucleoli. And there is some irregular anisonucleosis also can be seen, and there are big, big vacuoles. So, what does this cell actually remind you of? In histology, in histopathology, what cell would we call it? Signaturing. Very good. So, this looks almost like a signaturing cell. So, when do you, where do you see signaturing cells? Adenocarcinomas. Adenocarcinomas, right. So this, in, so, this can be very well mistaken for. I don't know, carcinoma. So, but in this case, we are giving you the history that she is on IUCD. So, when she's when there is a history of IUCD, and then you see these kind of vacillated cells, be extremely cautious before interpreting it as an adenocarcinoma. Look at the nuclei. There is prominence of uh, nucleoli. The chromatin is actually little bit coarse here, but overall, there is. It's not that. It's not a very pleomorphic looking. Cell. So, so reactive cellular changes with IUCD can be seen in both endometrial and endocervical cells. They are usually single or in clusters. And note that the background will be clean. You might see the inflammation in the background. So, you can have variable amount of cytoplasm with large vacuoles. And some cells may even show increased NC ratio. But the nuclear will show some degeneration with wrinkled chromatin or nuclear cracking and again nucleoli will be prominent. So this is actually a very difficult area. So it is important that we get the history of IUCD because otherwise it can be mistaken for adenocarcinoma of endometrium, fallopian tube or ovary or a signaturing cell carcinoma. And when it is present singly atypical cells with high NC ratio, sometimes it gets misinterpreted for head cell also. So you need to be extremely cautious before calling out adenocarcinoma in a patient with IUCD. If there is any doubt, you need to actually even consider recommending removal of IUCD followed by repeat smear. So these are some non-neoplastic findings which can pose great diagnostic difficulties in glandular epithelium. So we need to be aware of these differentials. Okay, so any doubts as of now? A couple of doubts, ma'am. One, will these signet cells be pass D negative? Yes, they will be pass D negative because the vacuolization is actually not caused by mucin. It is actually a reactive change. So they will probably be pass D negative. Another question I think you'll be coming up to is how to differentiate tubal metaplasia from an adenocarcinoma in C2 with feathering? Yes, we will come to that, yeah. We will come to that in the later part of the uh, presentation. All right. So, um, Rajiv, this is a 52-year-old lady. I'm giving you a history of vaginal hysterectomy. Okay. Three years ago, she's had hysterectomy. What are these cells? Are they squamous cells or glandular cells or what are they? So, if she's yeah. had... See, this is actually a vaginal smear. This is not a cervical smear. Is it it? She's had a hysterectomy, so it is a vaginal smear. No, this is uh, this is squamous cells. So, uh, you're calling them as squamous cells. Number squamous cells, but nucleomegaly is there, man. 
Uh, anyone else? Are you calling them as famouses, all of you? Endo cervical cells. Yeah, these are actually, you can't really call them definitely as endo cervical. But yeah, yes, they are columnar cells falling more into endo cervical cell category. Okay, so these are actually glandular cells. So she has actually had a hysterectomy. So you should really not be seeing glandular cells in a patient who's had hysterectomy, isn't it? In a vaginal smear, you can only see squamous cells. So should you be worried? Sweetie, what do you think? Should you be worried? How can glandular cells come? You need to be worried, is it? Okay, but do you, are you worried about the morphology of these cells? What is the chromatin looking like? Are you worried about the chromatin here? Are the nuclei, they are just hypochromatic, isn't Hypo it? Hypochromatic only. You can see one or two nu nucleoli. Chromatin is actually fine. You are not seeing coarse chromatin. Okay? So... This is an entity called glandular cells status post hysterectomy. So you can see benign appearing endocervical type glandular cells. Very rarely they might resemble endometrial cells also. They can even show goblet cell or mucinous metaplasia. And the presence of these cells should not be a concern for neoplasia. When you see these cells in a patient who is post hysterectomy, Look at the nuclear morphology, look at the chromatin especially and see whether it is uh, finely granular chromatin or are you seeing any coarseness of chromatin? Are the nuclei hypochromatic? Or are they dark staining? Look at the NC ratio. These are some of the things you need to look at and then you need to just satisfy yourselves because glandular cells can be present post hysterectomy. They say that there are glandular cell nests or nests which can be found in the vaginal mucosa. So this is what leads to presence of glandular cells post stricter. So this is an entity we need to be aware of and not to get worried about. Um, can any of you tell me what you think this cluster is? There's a lot of inflammation in the background. This looks like a slightly cohesive dark staining cluster, right? This is textbook picture. This is not our case picture. Okay, so these are actually histiocytes. Okay, so this is also something you need to be careful about. Again, the differential becomes atypical endometrial cells. So, this kind of clusters also can be present. For a novice pathologist, often they get mistaken for atypical endometrial cells. And again, what is this? This kind of cluster, a tight cluster. There is hardly any cytoplasm here. This is something called as naked nuclei. So this is a mimic of exfoliated endometrial cells. These can be seen in older age groups. So this again sometimes gets mistaken for endometrial cells and gets reported as presence of endometrial cells in a lady who is more than 45 years of age. But this complete absence of cytoplasm but there will be also smooth nuclear contours with some molding also can be present. This incident increases with age but this should again not get mistaken for neoplasia. Having told you all of these, it is very difficult sometimes to exclude um, atypical endometrial cells in the context of naked nuclei and also with histiocytes. This is just for us to be aware that these are actually non-neoplastic findings which can fall into the differentials for atypical endometrial cells. Okay, so with that we come to the end of uh, normal morphology and the slight variations from normal morphology and non-neoplastic findings. Now we will go on to epithelial cell abnormalities. Okay. So, um, Saif, can you tell mm -hmm. me, Saif, are you there? Yeah. Can you tell me, uh, you know, how do you list out glandular epithelial cell abnormalities? Uh, we first uh, uh, see the uh, nuclear size. There will be. Uh, in, uh, I'm not asking lamina. you for the features. I'm asking you to list it out. What are the names of the entities? Uh, uh, sorry, no. uh, it would be. Uh, How do we start classifying glandular epithelial cell abnormalities? Yes, ma'am. Uh, not otherwise, we have endocervical, uh, endometrial, um, 
and uh, uh, endometrial and endo cervical endometrial cells or tpr uh, then uh, we have uh, endo cervical uh, uh, atpr favor of neoplasia then we have uh, adenocarcinoma in situ and then we have endo cervical uh, carcinoma very good so this is actually the classification so there is under the atypical criteria we have the nos right endo cervical endometrial and glandular you look you just left out glandular dr saif and you also have endo cervical fever neoplastic glandular fever neoplastic like you said adenocarcinoma in situ and then it goes on to adenocarcinoma which can be endo cervical endometrial sometimes extra uterine like ovarian also gets exfoliated we might see that also and also sometimes we might say adenocarcinoma not otherwise specified like you know sometimes rectal adenocarcinomas which are infiltrating can also get exfoliated and come in the cervical smears so this is actually the classification now when we say atypical we mean that it is more than benign but not falling into the neoplastic category in squamous we saw an entity called as ascus isn't it but in glandular they do want to keep a category as agus or atypical glandular cells of uncertain significance such an entity does not exist under bethesda for glandular epithelium because they feel that it might very often get confused with ascus okay another point to note here is that see this is endocervical nos endometrial nos glandular nos when you come to fever neoplastic we have we are missing one category isn't it we are missing the endometrial category endometrial nos is there endometrial fever neoplastic is not there because it is very well recognized and understood that it is very difficult to further classify endometrial cells atypical as nos or neoplastic because most of the time this further classification on cervical cytology smears is not correlating with the biopsy outcome so they feel that it is safer to leave endometrial as only nos not otherwise specified and not to go into favor neoplastic or nos as a further sub classification endometrial atypical cells another point to note is that there is we do not use the term favor reactive we cannot call atypical endocervical cells favor reactive that term also is discouraged because bethesda feels that if we see favor reactive we don't know really sometimes we really can't make out when we are seeing some atypia we can only say nos or neoplastic when we say reactive the clinician might ignore it and leave the patient alone they don't want that to happen any kind of atypia they want some follow up to be there for the patient so they do not recommend atypical endocervical cells favor reactive okay so these are some points to note when before we start the glandular epithelial cell abnormalities so atypical endocervical cells i will already told you more than normal not sufficient to put into neoplastic category and again there is aec nos and aec neoplastic i'm just going to show you some textbook pictures now first let us remind ourselves of what reactive looks like so reactive you can see that the cells are very distinct from each other okay they look actually pretty scary if you look at it it actually looks really scary but you need to remember and look for the specific criteria there is no overlapping well defined cell borders are there prominent nucleoli are present and the nuclear contours continue to be smooth okay so even though there is so much of anisonucleosis the well defined cell borders and the the chromatin is like that and the prominence of nucleoli and the smoothness of nuclear contours should tell you that this is probably just a reactive uh, uh, phenomenon especially with some neutrophils sitting there within the cytoplasm okay so this is reactive endocervical cells now this is atypical endocervical cells nos so here you can see that you can make out cell borders there might be some minimal overlap okay nuclear enlargement is there nc ratio is increased there is hyperchromasia some mild nuclear membrane irregularities you can make out so but you cannot definitely say that this is an uh, neoplastic because the chromatin still remains sort of fine okay it's not really coarse chromatin now look at this 
this is favor neoplastic why because there is definitely overlapping this is actually a stratified strip there is nuclear stratification and you can see that the chromatin is definitely coarse okay and here you can see some nuclear membrane irregularity it is not really very prominently seen in this particular cluster there is some nuclear irre membrane irregularity and you can see that the NC ratio, if you look at individual cell, the NC ratio is markedly increased. And the nuclei definitely look dark as against the hypochromasia that you see in other kind of atypical cervical cells. Okay. With that, we are going into the next case. So, um, in this particular case, we will cover the entire endocervical spectrum. Uh, Oh, no, no, not in this case, yeah. Okay, so this case, uh, Dr. Saif, will you actually describe this case for me? So she is a 45-year-old lady with abnormal uterine bleeding. That's the history we've got, okay? So what do you see in the background? What are the predominant cells in the background? Along with the You see squamous cells in the background, yes? Uh, in the and then you see some clusters now. Yeah, some clusters of cells you are able to make out here. Okay, they are a bit dark, isn't it? So yes. these are actually looking dark clusters. Now, what do you think they are? Uh, they have a uh, hypochromatic nuclei. Yes. So overlapping. Yes. Uh, then uh, at the periphery line, they show uh, the feathering. Yeah, so what is that feathering? That is what you are seeing here, right? You are seeing some feathering in these clusters. Again, you can see that there is feathering in these clusters. Okay. And here you can see that it's actually forming something like asana yes. pattern. Yes. crowding. Okay. Again, these clusters are also showing you. So, what is feathering size? Uh, an equivalent of uh, uh, human diabetes. Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Could you please repeat that? Ma'am, uh, it is like a uh, tumor diagnosis. You think tumor diagnosis? A nuclear protrusions. Yeah, nuclear protrusions. Nuclear protrusions along the periphery. Yes, so it is cytoplasmic or nuclear protrusions or tags at the periphery which are standing out. So, you can see that. This is actually cytoplasmic or nuclear protrusion at the periphery, okay? Again, you can see very nicely, you can see the protrusion at the periphery. So, this is a very distinctive feature of what entity size, what can be a diagnosis on this case? Atypical uh, endocervical cells favoring neoplasia. Atypical endocervical cells favoring? Neoplasia. Neoplastic, okay. Uh, Dr. Ayushi or Dr. Pratik, would any of you like to give any other diagnosis for this case? Can we uh, in situ endinoplasma in situ because of the SNI formation and feathering? Yes, very good. So this is actually adenocarcinoma in situ. So yeah, when we were talking about atypical cells favor neoplastic, I did not mention feathering at all. Feathering? is not a feature of atypical endocervical cells favor neoplastic. Feathering is a very distinctive and specific feature for adenocarcinoma in situ for endocervical cells. So this is endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ. And like you said clearly, this is actually protrusion of the cytoplasm and the nucleus, which can be seen in adenocarcinoma in situ. So there was a question previously about how do you differentiate it from tubal metaplasia, right? So, in tubal metaplasia, we will not see these kind of things. What you are looking for in tubal metaplasia is actually cilia. We are not looking for cytoplasmic protrusion, okay? So, cytoplasmic and nuclear protrusion will not happen in tubal metaplasia. Like the picture that I had shown earlier, um, if you want for further clarification, I can go, go, I can go back to that picture. So that will actually show cilia and terminal bodies and terminal bars and not cytoplasmic protrusion. So that is the difference between tubal metaplasia and this. So cilia will be much finer. 
this will be actually you can see that it is the same color in this particular thing you can't really make out much cytoplasm at all but it will look the same color and and the you know the the density of the cytoplasm will be the same as what you see in this cytoplasmic protrusion that you are seeing here at feathering so this is endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ so there is nuclear enlargement hypochromasia chromatin abnormality pseudo stratification and mitotic activity also can be seen and up to half of AIS lesions will have a coexisting squamous intraepithelial lesion also usually of high grade because they are all HPV related. The HPV dependent ones will also show a coexisting squamous intraepithelial lesion. So this is a very crowded uh, slide. So cells will occur in sheets, clusters, pseudostratified strips or rosettes. So this is actually a, oh sorry I can't get the pictures again. Yeah, this is actually what they call as a rosette pattern. So that is the appearance of the uh, cells. There will be nuclear crowding and overlap, loss of a well-defined honeycomb pattern. And this is the palisading nuclear arrangement with nuclear and cytoplasmic tags protruding from the periphery, which is the feathering, which is a very important feature to note. And then there will be increase in NC ratio. Nuclei can be over or elongated. Nuclear hyperchromasia, ghostly granular chromatin, nucleoli are inconspicuous, background is clean. You might see abnormal squamous cells if there is a coexisting squamous epithelial lesion. So what is the significance of reporting AIS? So when we call something as AIS, according to the ACCP guidelines, colposcopy and endocervical sampling has to be done. But if the patient is more than 35 years of age, endometrial sampling also should be done. And when you do an initial biopsy, if there is uh, no evidence of invasive disease, diagnostic excision has to be done. If it is present on the biopsy also, the final outcome will be total hysterectomy. Unless they want to do a conservative management, if conservative, you can do an excisional procedure like leak margin evaluation. So that is the significance of reporting AIS. Okay. Now, uh, going to case 4, Dr. Ayushi. Will you present this please? This is a 65 year old lady with two episodes of post menopausal bleeding. So in this particular case, there will be the entire spectrum of endocervical cells beginning from benign right up to the uh, highest grade of the endocervical abnormality. Okay, so you need to look for all the features. Ayushi? Um, she is a honeycomb uh, pattern of endocervical cells. Very good. So this is a benign honeycomb pattern. Okay. Here again you are seeing the benign honeycomb pattern. But what about this one? It is overlapping and crowding at places. Okay, yes, definitely there. So there is some you are beginning to feel that there is some atopia there. What about this cluster? There is uh, again there is overlapping and overcrowding. There is a loss of... Uh, what do you think about the chromatin here? It is fine. It is fine hyper chromatin. What about the uh, nuclear contours? Regular. Regular and smooth. What do you see there? What am I pointing to? Granular dichromocenters. Okay. Nucleoli. Nucleoli you are seeing there, right? And what are these cells? Which are admixed with these endocervical cells? Polymorphs. No? Polymorphs. Okay. That's right. So what do you want to call this sheet? Reactive. Reactive endocervical cells. Very good. So you're seeing reactive endocervical epithelium also. Now come to this one. Compare that and this. Here there was not much crowding or overlapping. But here there is? Crowding and overlapping. Crowding and overlapping. Okay. But what about the chromatin? It is still fine. Sorry. Actually, when you look at uh, endocervical or endometrial cells, often you will have to use the um, fine adjustment to be able to see the chromatin clearly because they are very crowded and when they are crowded and overlapped especially because you need to be able to see through to see the nuclei. So you will have to use in real life a lot of your fine adjustment to see through to the chromatin. Okay, so here again it's not dark, it's still light colored chromatin. That much you can make out in this cluster, isn't it? Yeah, it's not very dark, but it's crowded. So this will fall under these clusters. This also, these kind of clusters will fall under. Atypical glandular cells, NOS. 
NOS. Very good. So this is atypical endocervical NOS. Okay. Now here it is getting little more darker. Isn't it? So you can see that it's crowded. It's darker. Okay. Here also. Here you're seeing a benign looking sheet. Yes. But right here you're seeing some crowding. This is the cluster which is very much crowded. Here but at the periphery you can make out the chromatin. You can make out some chromatin here, you can make out chromatin here and you can see that it is still not that coarse, it is still finely granular chromatin. So this will also fall under atypical NOS. Now what about these clusters? Overcrowded, there is overlapping, there is feathering in the periphery. Okay, very good. And the chromatin is getting a bit more coarse, isn't it? It's becoming a little coarse chromatin. Here again you can see that the chromatin is definitely coarse here. Okay, and there is crowding. And this is almost like an asana formation that is happening here. Again, a crowded cluster. Coarseness of chromatin which you can see in that periphery. Here you can nicely see the coarseness of the chromatin. Okay, so this is, you need to really look at the periphery to be able to see the chromatin because in the center it will all be very crowded and we, you will not be able to see the chromatin. So you need to go to the cells at the periphery to see the chromatin. So you can definitely see the coarseness of chromatin here. So this will become a typical favor. Neoplastic. Neoplastic. So again, definitely this is, you're seeing some asana pattern here and you're seeing the cells with coarse chromatin favor neoplastic. Okay. Now what is this thing that you're noting here? Cytoplasmic tails. Yeah. So you're beginning to see some protrusions, some tags. You're beginning to see some tags here. Right? You're able to see nice tags here. Okay. So what will you call this? Feathering. Yes, feathering. So, what are what will what criteria will what uh, classification will this fall under? In situ, adenocarcinoma in situ. Adenocarcinoma in situ. So, you can see the nice cytoplasmic tags here, right? So, this is adenocarcinoma in situ, and you can see the very crowded clusters, and you can see the coarseness of chromatin in the periphery of these clusters. So, this is adenocarcinoma in situ. This is also showing the cytoplasmic tags sort of an asana pattern there and coarseness of chromatin. So this is adenocarcinoma in situ. Even this cell is actually abnormal. This cell is also abnormal. You can see the chromatin that is coarse. You can see that the NC ratio is markedly increased, isn't it? Hardly any cytoplasm. So normal endocervical cells should have a lot of cytoplasm. So here you can see that the NC ratio is markedly increased. Are you able to make out any cell borders, Ayushi? No. There is loss of defined cytoplasmic margins. Yes, so there is loss of the cytoplasmic margins. So it is a where the the architecture is lost. You are not seeing that um, well defined cytoplasmic borders. Anymore. What do you think this background looks like? Necrotic debris. There is like, yes, so it is looking like a dirty background. There seems to be some debris, and there are these some cohesive clusters that you are seeing here, right? So the background is actually very dirty. There must be some necrotic material there, some debris is lying there and you're seeing some dark looking clusters here and there. What do you think these cells look like? There is tumor diastasis in the periphery. There is overlapping, overcrowding. What is this actually? So this is the tumor diathesis. What is tumor diathesis, Ayushi? The necrotic, the necrosis of the cells. Okay. Admixed with? Inflammatory cells. Admixed with inflammatory cells. And it is usually just sort of clinging to the basement. So it is actually, this is all LBC. So you see what is called as? Clinging diathesis here. So you can see the debris with inflammatory cells and clinging diathesis. And here you can see that the cells are looking little more pleomorphic also. Here you can see this is again the diathesis, right? 
So you see the cell is also actually not very well preserved. It's almost looking like it's going to die. Okay, it's not very well preserved cell. But you can see that it's got irregularity of nuclear membrane. Definitely it's a neoplastic cell and it's lying within what looks like necrotic debris and inflammatory cells. So here what do you see Ayushi? Can you describe the cells that you're seeing here? So a uh, moderately pyomorphic cells with enlarged nuclei, oval to oh, round to oval nuclei and the chromatin is coarsely, coarse, closely granular. There is conspicuous nuclei. Yes. And their cytoplasmic mem the margin they are lost. Yes, very good. And you're also seeing some nuclear uh, irregularity. Some irregularity of the nuclear membrane also can be made out. So what do you want to call this finally? Adenocarcinoma. Endocervical adenocarcinoma. Endocervical adenocarcinoma. Okay. So endocervical adenocarcinoma, you'll have a lot of abnormal cells. They will be present as single cells, two-dimensional sheets, three-dimensional clusters, or essential aggregates. And we saw those enlarged pleomorphic nuclei with irregular chromatin, chromatin clearing, nuclear abnormalities. Macronucleoli also can be found. I'm sorry, none of my pictures actually showed that. But macronucleoli can be found. Cytoplasm can be vacuolated. Tumor diathesis is commonly seen. And quite often, it coexists with a high-grade squamous lesion also. So you might see abnormal squamous cells also. So at this point, doubts? Uh, how to differentiate school of fish appearance in the glandular cells with metablastic squamous cells? Okay, so school of fish appearance in glandular cells is what we see usually in uh, reactive endocervical cells. So school of fish is actually an interdigitating appearance and you can see that the cytoplasm also looks a bit pulled. Should I go back to that picture? Shall I go back to that picture? Yes, ma'am. So this is actually the school of fish appearance as described in the textbook. And so uh, this is the interdigitating. So the cytoplasm is actually interdigitating, giving the school of fish appearance. But these are actually um, reactive cells. So we need to look for features of reactive cells, one of which is actually the presence of nucleolite. So you can definitely see that there is nucleolite present in these cells. And also you will see that these cells are admixed with neutrophil. So that is another feature which points to the reactive nature of this entire sheet. And if you look at uh, uh, metaplastic squamous cells, they are usually called as spider cells because the cytoplasm, each cell set, here you can see that it's only bipolar. I mean, on two sides the cytoplasm is pulled, whereas the spider cells will be actually looking like they will, they will have, the cytoplasm will be extended on multiple sides. Okay. And if you look at LBC, metaplastic cells actually look much more rounded. In conventional, they've got the spider cell appearance. In, in LBC, they will have actually a rounded appearance. Whereas these cells will show cytoplasmic appendage pulling only to the two ends, not on all sides. And you will also see I mean, presence of nucleoli and inflammatory background. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You can continue. Okay. Okay, so that finishes endocervical adenocarcinoma. Now going to the last case, which is actually 58-year-old lady with post-menopausal spotting. Dr. Pratik, yes, would you like to uh, take this case? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, I need to go full screen. Yeah. Okay, so this is a low par picture. So what, what is catching your attention? Uh, ma'am, there, uh, um, there are 80 pills commerce cells, are there, ma'am? Okay, you want to call them straight away as squamous cells at no. low power? No, ma'am, no, no. that seems like a cluster of cells. Yeah, there are several tightly cohesive dark staining clusters that you can see. That is what is catching your attention in low power. Okay, now what do you think this sheet of cells is? 
are these endocervical or endometrial cells? Ma'am, endocervical, ma'am. Very good. So these are actually endocervical cells. And here you're seeing that the morphology is not at all clear. It is just showing an asana pattern there and some crowded cells are present. So you can see this is a looking like a nice sheet of endocervical cells. Maybe it's reactive, we don't know. But this one, there seems to be some atopia, isn't it? Because it's a bit crowded and dark and there's an asana pattern seen there. Okay. What are these cells, uh, Dr. Prati? These are uh, endometrial cells, ma'am. Very good. Why do you want to call them endometrial cells? Then uh, they have a central stroma and peripheral, uh, central stroma and peripheral glandular pattern. Okay, so they are actually a ball-like cluster yes. or a tightly cohesive cluster. And is it as large as those endocervical sheets? No. They are usually smaller, tightly cohesive clusters of cells. Okay, but are they normal? No, ma'am, no, ma'am. They are not normal. They, are, they have an esonucleosis and hyperchromatic nucleoli. Okay. Mild overlapping is also seen. Yes. And irregular cell borders are there, ma'am. Okay. So, we, uh, we, when we looked at normal endometrial cells, we said that they are usually small cells. Nuclear size will be very small. Okay. But here you can see that there is definitely nuclear size is enlarged. Okay. So that is the most important thing that you need to note when it comes to endometrial cells. The most important feature of distinction is that the nuclear size is enlarged compared to normal endometrial cells. And also, chromatin already in endometrial cells is a bit dense. Okay. It's usually dark. The clusters are usually dark. But here you can see that there is an abnormal architecture also that is present and the nuclear size is also increased. So those are important features to note. Here again, you can see that there is definitely increase in nuclear size in these clusters. So this is about atypical endometriosis. It's most important point of distinction is that the nuclear size is increased. But like I said before, we do not qualify as neoplastic or as uh, um, NOS because this is very difficult to differentiate and it's poorly reproducible. When we say atypical endometrial cells, it could be endometrial polyp, it could be endometritis, it could be presence of intrauterine device, it could be endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial carcinoma. So, very clearly, cervical pap smear is not the diagnostic uh, test to identify endometrial lesion. So, when you're suspecting an endometrial lesion, it might be picked up on the pap smear, but it is always the final diagnosis is only on biopsy. Okay, so biopsy becomes essential even when you call something as atypical endometrial cells. So they occur as small crowded groups. Nuclei are slightly enlarged compared to normal endometrial cells. As the grade of the tumor increases, the nuclear size keeps increasing. Hyperchromasia, chromatin heterogeneity, small nucleoli, scan cytoplasm which may be vacuolated, cell borders are ill-defined. In LBC, even the shed endometrial cells may appear abnormal, showing greater pleomorphism of size and shape. So sometimes even the normal shed endometrial cells get reported as atypical endometrial cells on LBC. So now, look at this picture. What do you see here? What is this in the background? It's a dirty background, ma'am. Yeah, some degenerate material is present in the background. And then there are, what are these? It's a cluster of cells, cohesive clusters of cells. Okay. Yeah. Now, can you describe these cells? Uh, Ma'am, uh, these are the, the cohesive cells uh, showing uh, high NC ratio in large nucleus with uh, hyperchromatic nucleoli, diffused with uh, their prominent nucleoli as well, and cytoplasm, so vacuolations. So, there is nice cytoplasmic vacuolation which you can see here. What is this? Um, this mitosis. Yes, so there is even a mitotic figure that is seen here. And you can see that there is prominence of nucleoli. And like I told you earlier, um, sorry. Yeah, nucleoli will be present and nuclei, sorry, it comes later. I'm sorry, I'll tell you that. That the nucleoli <laughs> are present, but the size of the nucleoli keeps increasing with the higher grade of the tumor. Okay, sometimes they may be very small nucleoli in well differentiated tumors. As the grade of the tumor increases, nucleoli can be seen as more prominent features. 
Okay, so this is uh, definitely a mitotic figure, vacuolation and definitely abnormal looking endometrial cells. Again, what do you see here? This is a small, uh, low power view. This is a higher power view of the same cluster. What is catching your attention is what is this? More prominent vacuolations and the multiple prominent nuclei as well. Prominent nuclei are there. And you can see that the chromatin not very clearly seen, but there is coarseness of chromatin also. Here again, you can see that there's vacuolation, prominence of nucleoli. So here also here, what do you see? What kind of a pattern are you seeing here? I see no pattern now. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, so I see you're seeing an asana pattern and there is prominence of nucleoli also which you're seeing here. Again, sort of similar thing, but what is different here? What is inside all these cells? The neutrophils. Yes, very good. So is there any specific name for this appearance, Pratik? Um, a bag of uh, bag of polys. Very good. So that is a bag of polys. So this is a very classical feature of endometrial adenocarcinomas, where you see vacuolated cytoplasm filled with neutrophils. So it is called as bag of polys appearance. Okay, so you can see all these cells have got lot of neutrophils within the cytoplasm, and they are big, big cells with big, big nuclei and big, big nucleoli. So they are. Clearly, atypical endometrial cells, which are showing bag of poly appearance. Again, you can see atypical endometrial cells and there is the bag of poly appearance, which is quite a characteristic feature of endometrial adenocarcinoma. So the diagnosis, I've said it already, Pratik. So do you agree with me? Yes, ma'am. So this is an endometrial adenocarcinoma. So cells appear occur singly or in small tight clusters. In well-differentiated tumors, nuclei may be slightly enlarged and they increase with, uh, get larger with increasing grade, nuclear size variation, loss of polarity, hyperchromasia, irregular chromatin, chromatin clearing, particularly in high-grade tumors, small to prominent nucleoli, like I said, nucleoli become larger and larger with higher grade of tumor, cytoplasm is scant, cyanophilic, often vacuolated. So the bag of poly appearance is often seen. Grade 1 tumors look almost like, just look like abnormal cells, shed cells with uh, shed cells with minimal atopia. They get interpreted as atypical endometrial cells. And you need to remember that in those cervical tumors, we will often see lots and lots of atypical cells because you're directly sampling the cervix. Whereas endometrial atypical cells often will be very few here and there because they are, they are actually exfoliated from the endometrium you're not directly sampling them. So exfoliated neoplastic endometrial cells are usually fewer compared to endo endocervical cancers. And the cells are usually smaller with smaller nuclear, nuclear area. Tumor diathesis is usually watery or just finely granular. So that is about endometrial adenocarcinomas. This table is straight out of textbook. You can look at it in your books also. Comparison between endocervical and endometrial carcinoma. Hypercellular, low cellularity because this is exfoliated cells. Strips, rosettes, sheets with feathering or single cells. Here they are small clusters, very rarely papillae or single cells. Diathesis usually it is visible. Here it is variable and watery, subtle, sometimes even absent. Cell shapes, oval, columnar, pleomorphic. Here they are round cells. Even the very pleomorphic cells are actually round with irregular appearance sometimes, but they are usually smaller. Nuclei will be oval elongated pleomorphic vesicular. Here nuclei, as it, the grade goes higher, it becomes higher grade looking. Nucin will be present here. Here vacuoles will be present. Associated squamous lesion will be present usually in endocervical, not seen in endometrial. Again, because endocervical ones are HPV dependent tumors can be present. High risk HPV is positive and most negative. P16, because of the HPV positivity, will be block positive, which can be done on cell blocks which can be prepared from the LBC sample. So the remaining LBC sample can be even converted into cell block and P16 can be done. It will be block positive in endocervicals and may be patchy positive in endometrials. One last thing, we left out atypical glandular cells. So when do we call something as atypical glandular cells? And you cannot definitely assign it as endocervical or endometrial. But quite often, Hetzel-involving glands gets reported as atypical glandular cells. 
So they will be tightly packed cells with high NC ratios, hyperchromatic nuclei, and coarsely granular chromatin. But pretty often, head cell involving endocytic glands may be called, reported as atypical glandular cells. Now look at all these pictures. Looks like there's a lot of cytoplasm. I'm not sure, is this endometrial or endocervical? I'm really not sure. I might want to call this endometrial. You might want to call it endocervical. So when we are in such a scenario, whether we are not sure whether it's endometrial or endocervical, now the architecture looks like it could be endometrial, but you can see that the cells are actually separate from distinct from each other. There's more cytoplasm around the cells. So I'm not sure these are endometrial or endocervical cells. Again, cells like these. When I look at this, I even wonder, is this actually head cell that I'm looking at or is it glandular cells that I'm looking at? I'm really not sure. So I might report these as atypical glandular cells. So these are some things which can be reported as atypical glandular cells. They turn out to be high grade lesions 10 to 40% of the time and they're more often squamous than glandular. And head cell frequently coexist with this. So when you call something as atypical glandular cells, again they do colposcopy with endocervical sampling. If more than 35 years, endometrial sampling also will be done. But when you call something as atypical glandular cells, repeat cytology is not an option. Waiting and repeating is not an option because when you call something atypical glandular, it is categorized as a high risk lesion. Okay. So with that, we come to the end of, uh, almost to the end of the session and definitely to the end of glandular cell abnormalities. Any questions? One query is, why do squamous metaplastic cells have angulated cytoplasm? I'm not really sure why they have angulated cytoplasm. Sharanjit ma'am, would you like to take on that? Like, I also can't think of a reason why they have an angulated cytoplasm. So. Then we'll go into the answers. I think one more query, uh, sorry, I left out was when you were discussing about histiocytes, the query was, uh, do, do we tend to see epithelioid cells in the apps? No, no, they are not epithelioid cells. If at all anything, they are tiny cells and their nuclei will be indented. So that is what gives a clue that these are actually histiocytes. Nuclei will be indented, but they'll be tightly cohesive. There won't be as much cytoplasm as in an epithelioid histiocyte. So we don't see epithelioid cells in cervical scars. And also related to the IUCD query uh, was uh, how, uh, I mean, after how much time of the IUCD removal should somebody repeat a pap smear because IUCD changes uh, can be alarming. So after the removal of IUCD, when should the pap be repeated? I'm not sure again about that. Dr. Sharanji, would you like to? I think uh, I have not read it. But I think the interval should be the usual interval that we can do, depending on the age of the patient, the one that is recommended by WHO. After, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the usual recommended interval can be done. Because we already know there's a history of IUCD. Yeah, yes, so if, if you are thinking there is a, uh, with IUCD, the patient also has a coexisting high-grade lesion. Yes. Is, uh, 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 I mean, there's also an existing uh, lesion is there. Then it becomes a difficult, uh, I mean, a different situation. So probably there is no such recommendation given in Bethesda for uh, such a situation. No, it's not really recommended in Bethesda. So not very sure. Maybe the clinicians might have the answer for this. Not sure. One more query is, can giant cells be seen in pap smears? Uh, yes, we will come to that actually as a part of these pre-test answers. And uh, how to confirm the signaturing cell from the differential in cervical pap? Dr. Shanka, can you rephrase your question? Because how to confirm signaturing cell from the differential is what she is posed. So it is actually a difficult question. So that is why IUCD, when you are really suspecting that there could be a malignancy, it is better to... Uh, remove the IUCD and then repeat the test. Again, sorry, we don't know what the interval should be. But how do you differentiate? Okay, so signaturing cells and these cells. The IUCD cells are supposed to have, the nuclei is supposed to have a degenerate or a wrinkled appearance. 
So that is what should give a clue that this is not really atypical glandular cells. They are just uh, cells because uh, the reactive change due to IUCD. But also, the pictures that we saw in IUCD, the, the cells that resemble signet ring cells in IUCD, if you look at their nucleus, the nucleus was ni nice round nucleus in most of the cells. Whereas, if, it is, if they are actual signet ring cells, in signet ring cells, you have a huge mucin vacuum pushing the nucleus to the periphery and the nucleus is compressed out. Yes. So that was not the type of nucleus that, you, that we saw in the IUCD. Slide. Yes, exactly. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chanaji. That is exactly the explanation for that. Again, queries related to the follow-up. Again, uh, after how many days for a follow-up for an ASCUS, the PAP has to be repeated. I, if, I'm, if, if I may, I think it's the ACOG guidelines give related to each of these categories. <laughs> the guidelines have to be followed. Yeah. Um, uh, they say that if you have ASCUS uh, or any of these squamous lesions, HRHPV testing is recommended. It's reflex. Yeah. So that is the current recommendation. But if we are unable to do HRHPV, uh, the smear has to be repeated 